for Reverend John Scott to bring you some good news. This is the Christmas season, and his, should I give it away? No, I'm not gonna give it away. <laughs> Just sit back and listen, take notes, take it all in. Here's Reverend John with good news. Ah, oh, good morning, worldwide spiritual family. It's so nice to, to I'm glad for you, no? I'm glad to know that those of you who we can't see, they're upon line with us the same way. So Ernest Holmes' letter spoke about when one speaks from heart to heart, something magical happens, doesn't it? Uh, in, the, in our lives and in the entire world. And something for me is happening quite magically all over this land we love called Jamaica and indeed across the entire globe. It, there is kind of something special and indefinable and wonderful about this time of year. And it is, I believe, the good news. So, you know, a friend of mine, her five or six year old granddaughter was badgering her about what she's giving her for Christmas. And she said, you know, I've been thinking, I was thinking about giving you a tin of green peas. I, you know, I, I, I love green peas. It's my favorite go-to snack and I got a whole case of them at Price Mart. I won't give you a whole case though because I want some for myself, but I'll give you a few tins, maybe half a dozen, with the child's face you can imagine. Just absolutely perfect. Green peas, Grammy? And then she must have remembered that it's not the gift, it's the love with which it is given that's so important. And so she said something that, you know, when children do this to you, they can have everything you have and more. She said, oh, well, Grammy, if it comes from you, I know it's given with love and I will love it. You know that she, the entire estate was willed to her immediately. So. I love that story, it resonates with me because it takes me back to <laughs> the genesis of my love for outrageous socks. Yeah, I've, told this, this, I've told you this before, but I had an aunt, bless her heart, she was called Aunt Tiny, and wherever she is on her onward journey in the light, I hope she's wearing a pair of socks. Every Christmas, she gave me a pair. They were either black, brown, or blue. I never wore them. And after a few years, I stopped even opening them. I just put them in my socks drawer. And then, one year in my early teens, my father burst through the bedroom door. And I was busy building something with what was called a Meccano set that my favorite uncle had given me for my birthday in October. This was near Christmas, though, and he said, good news, good news, son. Aunt Tanya has sent you a Christmas present early. <laughs> Hear me, thank you, Dad. Put it in a little socks drawer for me. I never even looked up. And Dad had a, 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 a theory that one shouldn't eat one's porridge when it is hot. You know, we said in Jamaica, no, eat your porridge when it's hot. Meaning when you're angry or vexed or down or uh, not feeling your best and highest self, don't deal with the matter then. Put it down for later. So nothing was said at dinner that night. And next evening, I got the loving lecture. Now, at the same time, my parents are a trip, you know. I have to say, and grandparents. If you wanted to do something when I was a teenager, don't tell your parents that everybody else is going to be there or going to be doing it, because that was surely the cue for them to say, no, you're not going. Well, there was a musical group called Bill Haley and the Comets. Mm -hmm. Some of you, I don't want to give away your age paper, may remember. And Bill Haley and the Comets were due to perform in Jamaica. And of course, what did my parents say? You can't go. But daddy, everybody is going. You're not everybody. You can't go. So next the night, after I got this early gift from my aunt at dinner, daddy said, you know, son, your aunt deprives herself of something every year 
to give you what you might consider to be a very unimaginative gift. And, but it's given with love. And I want to suggest that you may want to consider opening this present tonight after dinner. There may be a good reason why Aunt Tani gave you the present so early. So reluctantly, I went to my room after dinner and I opened the packet. And it was a pair of socks. But guess what? They were neon green rock around the clock socks, which was named after one of the popular songs of Bill Haley and the Comets. And along with the socks, not one, but two tickets, box seats to the show. Good news, good news. Come hear what little Jolly I say. Hey, hey. Good news, good news. Me I go Bill Haley and the Comets today. So I was overjoyed. And for the first year, it came to me how important it is that we acknowledge the gift, the gift of self that people give from their hearts, no matter how humble it may be, and whether it be a tin of green peas or a plain pair of socks, when it comes from the heart, it is something really special. Yes, so the good news, my friend, I've titled my encouragement, of course, Good News, Good News. And historically, the good news of Christmas proclaimed by Christian uh, preachers all over the world, all, all through the years, comes from John 3.16. And I quote, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all those who believe might not perish but have everlasting life. And this only begotten, you know, has been used to, to spread the, the news or the idea that Jesus was the exception, that there was something exceptional about him, and that he was the only begotten son of God. So what happened to you and me then? We're not begotten. Yes, we are. And so, in each of us, there is that which is begotten of the one source, the one energy, the one presence, the one invisible source of all good. Each of us is only begotten of God. And I, that is the message I want to leave with you as we prepare to celebrate Christmas, because it wasn't an exceptional thing. Jesus came to, to teach us that we too are begotten of something so great, so beautiful, so tender, so loving, so joyful, so perfect that if we could only just grasp that as the, our reason for being, as, as who we are and whose we are and why we have come, our lives would be entirely different stories. And in fact, the same angelic voices that welcome the coming of Jesus, the boy, the son of a carpenter and a young girl, who discovered the Christ. And you see, Christ wasn't Jesus' last name. You know, we, we talk about Jesus Christ, but Christ wasn't his last name. Christ is the principle of sonship and daughtership which has been bestowed on each and every one of us on this journey of light and life and truth that we have undertaken. And so, the good news is, is that you are the Christ begotten of the Father, only of the Father. Nobody else could bear you. Nobody else could bring you. But you know, friends, a lot of us are begotten of a lot of very mistaken ideas. You know, we're begotten of addiction sometimes, addiction to persons, places, and things. And you know, Mainstream media, and now social media, constantly bombards us with the message that we're not enough, 
and that if you only drink this liquor, drive this car, live in this house, you will, you will self-actualize and, and be in, you know. And so what happens is, if you were born a mango, plump and colorful and ripe and juicy, but the fashion is to be a banana, slim and yellow and sometimes speckled if you're too ripe, the media tells you, if you wear this perfume, you'll be a banana. If you live in this neighborhood, you'll be a banana. If you, if you associate with this set of people and wear these clothes, drive this car, belong to this club, you'll be a banana. And so you are a mango, you know, and you try your best. Wear the perfume, drive the car, live in the neighborhood, choose friends that look banana-ish to you, um, that speak banana language. And you try your best to be a banana. You know what ha happens? You end up being neither a good mango or a good banana. Because you can't be what you're not. If we can just remember that we are begotten. And you know, the mango isn't saying to the banana, I'm nicer, I'm better, I'm, I'm more in than you. Nor is the banana saying, Chuck, you missed the boatman. I'm me aware of, you know, pre this. I'm the one that holds this way these days. No, they are perfectly, perfectly contented to be who God created them to be. And you know, I never forget when I, I got the call to ministry. I got two calls. One was from God, but Reverend Thelma actually voiced it. And there was no telling her no, you know. You just said, what do I have to do, <laughs> you know. <laughs> she said, well, follow back on me and I will show you. But somebody said to me, well, what's going to be different about you? When you become a minister. And I said, nothing. I said, I, of the night of my ordination, I said it in the presence of Dr. Candice Beckett. I said, Father, are you call me, me never call you. So take what you get. I am going to change nothing except that I am going to allow my light to shine. So some people don't like my outspokenness and some people call me Irreverent John, which I love that name anyhow, um, because I say the first most convenient thing that come to my mouth, I used to get beaten for it, but I got it from my mother, my beloved late Daisy. So I used to get beaten for it, but she was actually seeing in me what? The mirror of herself. And you know, friends, the people in your life are there as mirrors of you. They are there to show you who you are. And I can tell you, the th and this is from deep experience, the things that irritate you in others, take another look inside yourself. All of, the, of what you are reacting to negatively is somewhere deep inside you waiting to be healed. And for me, the meaning of Christmas really is that that coming of that tender young baby, and you know, it, 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 the whole story, even if it's, it actually never goes so, it's such a beautiful story of a humble child being born in very less than, less than perfect circumstances, coming with the message to love one another, because we are divine. If you're a mango, you are divine. If you're a banana, you are divine. So don't allow the world to tell you that you are begotten of something less than your greatness, your beauty, and your reason for being. You know, some people believe that they've come from a line of people who had a particular illness. And so they think that their lot in life is to continue that tradition because it is, it is hereditary. Mash down that lie. The only thing that is hereditary is your godness. The goodness from which you came, streaming clouds of glory from the creator of all life, all things, all people, all beauty, all truth. And so... Jesus once asked his disciples, you know, I think it was Matthew 16, verses 13 or 
13 to 17. He said, and I quote, who do men say that the son of man is? Who them say, what am I say about me? We would say in Jamaica. And the disciple said, <laughs> well, master, the, the, uh, some say that you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus asked the million dollar question, but who you say maybe? Who do you say I am? And I can just imagine the embarrassed silence. You know, can you imagine these men, you know, they're, they were fishermen and tradesmen and rough people of the soil. And all of this high-flown philosophy of, you know, wh whom do people say that I am, you know, and all of that. Pass them by, you know. They just love this energy that, that emanated from the person that had discovered his divinity and was telling them that it belonged to them also. And so they, they kind of, you can just imagine, they're looking for an answer. Remember when you're in school and teacher asks a question and you're afraid, to, you know the answer, but you're afraid to say it because you, you think you might be wrong and you're going to sound stupid and the rest of the class going to laugh at you. And I believe it was Peter who said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ. You are the principle of sonship. And oh my God, just the thought of it that maybe that too could apply to me and to everybody else in this boat on this journey is just mind-boggling and breathtaking and ultra-wonderful. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Can you just turn to somebody near you at home or in the sanctuary and say, you are the Christ, the Son or daughter of the living God? You are the Christ, the daughter of the living God. You are the Christ, the daughter, the daughter, the son of the living God. Jesus. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon bar -Jonah, Simon the son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed it to you. But my Father in heaven, you know what Jesus was saying? You can't tell who may be by looking at what may have on. You can't tell who may be by looking on my face. You can't tell who may be by what car may drive and what neighborhood may live in. You can't tell who may be by who my friend them is. It is the Father within. The intuition, that means intuition, the teacher within you, that has the answer for you this Christmas, my friends, about who you are, a son or daughter of the living Spirit Almighty. What a gift. Now, if that ain't good news, you tell me what is. Good news. Everybody is a son or daughter of the infinite invisible. And so that brings me to your assignment. You know you have to get an assignment. Your mission, should you decide to undertake it, my friends, is to contemplate the truth of that saying, I am the son or daughter of the living God. That's the first part of your assignment. Just contemplate it and write it down in your journal. Write something to the effect of, I am a spiritual being. I am whole and free. I am master of my destiny. Let us say that. I am a spiritual being. I am whole and free. I am master of my destiny. And the other part of your assignment is to begin practicing to see the divinity in others. You know, I have a friend whose four-year-old grandson is into making mud pies. Are you, any of you remember making mud pies when you were little? Yeah. Not a very um, clean pastime. And the, the, <laughs> the mother wanted him to come in and she said, come inside at time to bathe and tell you are a dirty little boy. You see how early we get the labels put on us? You're rude. You're too back chat. You have too much, you have too much lip. It puts on, it's put on us very early, you know. 
I was listening to uh, Liz Terry's wonderful interview with Denise Williams about her upcoming spiritual um, prosperity adventure. And Liz was talking about the power of yes and no. And she said, just think back how early you began to be told no. No, don't touch that. No, be careful. No, that is grandma's um, Wedgwood vase. No, you're going to drop that um, juice on your nice dress that I just starched and put you in for, uh, for service this morning. Lord have mercy, you drop it upon your frock. We have to go change you. No, no, no. Those of you that have grandchildren and children, see if you can go a whole day without saying no to them. It's very hard. Because you see, the little boy walking right along the, the wall there, so on Seymour Avenue, balancing. And of course, the first thing in your mind is, Lord have mercy, and parents leave him with me. If him ever drop and broke anything, I'm in deep trouble. No! And of course, when you say no, you distract him. You say you're going to fall. And when you say you're going to fall, he makes a picture in his mind of what? Falling. See, this is a principle of neurolinguistic programming that Liz Terry teaches so wonderfully. Instead of that, if you could say, wow, what wonderful balance you have. Let me see if you can come down as easily as you went. By the time your heart, you know, your mouth, you know. <laughs> Trust me. But, that's a but with one T. Practice saying positive things to the people that you meet this Christmas, and particularly to the children. Because this is not a dirty little boy. This is a little boy with dirty hands and feet and clothes. And the way we can, we can begin to learn how to see the Christ and the divinity in people is to stop labeling. This person is a gone man. This woman don't have any, any, any dress sense. How, how she could have wear that come at church? Stop labeling. Even when you put good labels, that's a nice person. You know what you're doing? You are breaking the ninth commandment. Anybody remember what the ninth commandment is? Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And you know, when you, you bear false witness by saying unkind things or putting unkind labels on other people, you are bearing false witness. But even worse than that, we bear false witness against ourselves. Every time you say, I am, and say something negative, you are putting a label on yourself that is dissing God. Reverend, I don't feel good today. I'm not in a good place. I am not in a good place. This is the universe that the God, the, the God put you in, you know, and say, have dominion and spread love and joy. I'm not in a good place. You are dissing the creator, and that is what is meant by bearing false witness. Stop bearing false witness against yourself and others and begin to affirm your beauty, your greatness, your potential, your capability, and the beauty, potential, and capability of every single person that you meet on the path. Because, friends, they may have dirty hands and feet, hands and feet and faces soiled by the vicissitudes of life, their experiences, sometimes in the gutter, but that does not make them dirty. That means that they need washing off. And you have the gift of bringing them the good news. And that good news is that we are all incarnations of the one God. Incarnations just as Jesus was, of all the potential, all the goodness, all the beauty, all the joy, all the wonder, all the miracle of being a son or daughter of the living God. And so my prayer for you this Christmas is the deep knowing that the Christ indwelling is the law of your life. By this law, by this divine principle, my friends, 
You are the purveyor of the good news that we can accomplish whatever we desire because we are the sons and daughters of the royal household of God. We need only recognize the divinity in ourself and in every other self and believe in our hearts the good news that God so loved that he gave the world you. Namaste. wasn't it? <laughs> to recognize that we are the Christ in Christmas. You know, it's the Christ Mass, celebration of that Christ principle that Jesus knew so well and demonstrated so well throughout his life. And as we embody this principle, we then spread the love that we are called to be. We are the Christmas present. <laughs>